Now, is your accountant having conversations with you on how to prepare for an economic downturn? Like, is your business in the best position that it can be to survive that? Well, in today's episode, we're going to be talking about some interesting things that are happening in the market and what that actually means for your business and what kind of conversations your accountant should be having with you, but probably isn't. So stay tuned for today's episode. So let's just hop into the conversation. Welcome back, Lola. Thank you. Happy to be here. Excited to have this conversation today. So let's do it. Absolutely. So there's a lot of things going on in the news lately. I mean, around the markets. I mean, whenever you go through earnings season, um, all these companies are announcing, hey, how they performed, what their results look like. And then on top of that, you got some companies that are announcing layoffs. And you also have FTX, which is a cryptocurrency, which just filed for bankruptcy, which is also hitting the markets. And what is very interesting is at the same time, you have some politicians who are saying, no, the economy is strong. The economy is good. So as a business owner, it's just like, what do you believe? What do you do? So what's been some of your like initial takes on all of the stuff that's going on? Um. I think I would say, I would summarize, I have two quotes that would summarize kind of my initial takes on this. I think the first quote is, men lie, women lie, but the numbers don't lie. That's my favorite go-to quote because I think, you know, like if I think about the comment on the economy being strong and recession proofing and inflation cha- inflation tackling, all of these buzzwords that are used to basically talk about what we're doing to prevent something that basic economics um, explains is coming. I think for me, that's that's one. So like, I think like the numbers are and the proof is in the pudding, right? We see that, hey, there's more supply than there is demand. People are spending less money on their personal budget. Amazon is projecting a demand a demand decline and in, in people ordering stuff. So we're definitely seeing the numbers. And so to to say that, the economy is stronger than it's ever been. It's stronger than it was during COVID because I always think it's important when you're comparing numbers to always give it context. Um, But I do think that uh, the numbers are speaking for themselves. So the second thing I would say also is I think the this whole situation that's happening with FTX and 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 layoffs for me is just a an important reminder, not just on the personal side, but also for our business of just putting your head down and really understanding kind of how to prepare for what's coming and how to make sure that you're prepared personally, but also on the business side. So those are kind of the two things that I've been thinking about as we've been in this earning season, plus everything else going on in the news and um, the elections and all that stuff that I guess by the time this episode airs would have been a couple of weeks old, but still very relevant because I think it's at the top of people's minds. You know, and I think that's very, that's very true because one of the things that I find in talking to different people is people don't know how to make heads or tails of what's going Mm -hmm. on. I mean, they're hearing conflicting messages. They're trying to make the right decisions on their end and they're trying to figure things out, but they seem confused. They're getting conflicting messages. And at the same time, in some respects, Whenever I hear someone say, oh, the economy's good, economy's strong, I always say is, you know what, you almost have to ask yourself, what is that person calling the economy? Because one of those strange things that I think people forget is that, you know, if you're talking about the economy as a whole, that may be very different from me talking about your specific financial situation. So if I look at your microeconomic environment, maybe mm-hmm. very different from a macroeconomic environment. I think oftentimes people and especially accountants, accountants mm-hmm. just kind of follow what 
you know, they hear on MSNBC or Yahoo Finance or CNN Money or whatever, whatever channels they're following. But I do think when you know you're working with a good accountant is because they are looking at your micro economy. They are looking at your business. They're looking at your situation. And I think that when you start doing that, you start getting a different perspective on this. And so I'm excited to talk about some of these topics and just how it actually relates to, you know, business owners. And when business yeah. owners read that headline, what should that mean? So let's start yeah. off with, you know, the major companies, you know, I would say, let's start off with the major companies that are announcing layoffs. So, you know, if you're a small business owner and you're hearing about, you know, Facebook is laying off, you know, doing their biggest layoff ever, you know, and Amazon is laying off employees. Mm -hmm. you know, Twitter already had plans to lay people off when <laughs> Elon Musk was coming in, but uh -huh. the number is actually seeming to be a little bit bigger than what the initial thought was. So what's the what's the number for Twitter? I haven't heard that one. I don't remember the exact number, but it, it was it's a little bit bigger than what was, you know, what was initially um stated in different publications. But okay. all that saying is. As a small business owner, you know, you're an, if you're working as the accountant, you're working with a small business and you start hearing about these major companies that are doing layoffs in, you know, mid November. What's some of the things that you're thinking about for those small businesses? So I think the first thing is to understand your customer. So like, if I was an accountant, this is how I would do it or I am an accountant, but if I was supporting a small business owner, this is kind of what I would do. Um, so my walkthrough, just thinking about imagining a conversation we're having with one of our clients. I think the first thing that you need to understand is the market that that, that, that business owner serves, right? Because I think that one of the distinguishing factors, and I think that's extremely important when you were talking about macro versus micro, is you need to understand how what's happening impacts the product or the service that you offer, right? And this is one of the things where I think as business owners, sometimes it's easy to just say, okay, fine, the economy's taking a turn, people aren't spending money, it's, it's going down, all is lost, I don't want to, you know, I don't want to, basically a negative outlook. But I think the first important thing that I would say that I would ask them is, okay, how does this impact your business? What does this mean for your business? And I think I'll give a perfect example. I think, you know, one of the things that when we saw during COVID, there was a downturn in travel, right? Like people weren't traveling as much. A lot of travel agencies, a lot of companies, airlines were struggling. Um, but what of, one of the things now is like going into the recession, um, it would be wrong for you to just assume that people are going to stop traveling less or are going to travel, are not going to travel as much as they would. And one of the things I think that we've noticed after COVID is that there's been a shift in consumer habits and consumer spend. And so some of the spending habits that people had before COVID may not be relevant now because one of the things that I've seen that's been talked about at different, you know, marketing, marketing strategy sessions is how a lot of people are focusing more on the experiences, right? A lot of people are focusing on the experiences, like things that are important to them. So if you are, let's say your business is travel agencies, just because people are saying, that there's a downturn in the economy doesn't necessarily mean that people are going to stop spending money traveling. It just means that you need to think about as a business owner, how do you make whatever you're selling still considered to be valuable and fall within what that business owner considered or within that what that customer, excuse me, considers to be important. So I'd say like the first thing for me is just don't assume that this applies to your business. Understand like if we if we look now, like with the small business, um, you know, small business um, Saturday coming up, right? That's an area where a lot of times people go out support the community, and so it's my question is always back to, hey, how does what's happening apply to my business specifically, and how do I position my product to still be considered important to my potential and prospective customers so that they do spend money with me. You know, that's a really good point, because I do think that, you know, taking that step back to really look at your customers and understand, you know, like, who are my customers, which mm -hmm. I think is something that every business owner should do. 
But when you start to look at your customers and you start to understand like what's going on in the economy, then right. I think you can ask yourself some you know important questions of like, hey, will this impact my my you know my my customers? Like for yeah. example, I would say if you're you know if you're looking, you're seeing like, hey, Amazon's going to be laying off a lot of employees. Well, mm -hmm. when you look at the type of products and services you offer, if you know people who are Amazon employees are like the likely customers for your product, then, hey, that could have a direct impact on you. Right. But let's right. say, you know, if Amazon's laying off employees, but you sell, you know, high end luxury goods, mm -hmm. it may not have as much of a direct impact on you. I mean, if you're doing yeah. in luxury goods, like the Amazon employees that are getting laid off may not necessarily be your client base. So I think that's a really good point of just making sure that first of, do you understand your own clientele and does that have an impact on the people that you directly serve? Yeah. And I think uh, actually you, when you said that I, it triggered something for me because I think it's important to understand the customer base, but I think it's also important to understand the supply chain piece of it. Right. So like, for example, if you market or if you sell to high end, if you sell high end luxury products and you deliver through Amazon, let's say you sell on Amazon, when there are 11,000 people being cut, that means that it may take longer for products to get to your customers. So now you need to think about what alternatives can you find in your shipments, especially during the holidays, because we know people are always ordering on Amazon. And so one of the things that I think Terrell, that's important that I that I think about is you need to just not only understand your customer base, but you also need to understand like how does this impact how you get your products to your customer, right? So like things like Amazon, things like UPS, things like FedEx, when those start to get impacted, um, and when your supply chain starts to get impacted, then you know you have to be creative and come up with different ways to to meet um, meet your customer demand. No, that that makes a lot of sense because I, I do think that, you know, that's an aspect of economics that I personally think that a lot of pundits or, or you say political pundits, news pundits, a lot of people who share their opinion about the economy is I think that they fail to really bring the supply chain into the conversation. And yeah. they're all talking about, well, the demand, the demand, the demand. But when you don't look at the supply chain, because the, the supply chain, I mean, economics is supply and demand and, and you mm -hmm. know, and human behavior on mm -hmm. how they respond to those two things. Like you said, if you don't, you're not looking at the supply, I think you could be missing a big part of the, the, the picture. Because even as you were talking, one of the things that I was thinking about is, let's say if you know, you're a, you know, you're a local business, mm -hmm. you may be getting, you know, pretty much outperformed by Amazon because they're able to deliver and they're able to turn things over faster. Well, if yeah. Amazon has less employees, they may not have as fast a delivery in exactly. your area, which means yeah. as a local business, it's just like, you now have an opportunity to say, Hey, we can, you know, we can actually deliver same day or we can deliver next day. I mm -hmm. think it gives you a chance once you understand like the dynamics of your business and your business environment and you understand your customers and how your, you know, whole supply chain and competitors. I think, you know, seeing other companies take, you know, different steps could be something I think that opens an opportunity for you that didn't exist before. No, that's and really good. That That's really good. So I, I guess I think just to maybe make this practical, can we maybe just take a, a sector or like a business and maybe just kind of walk through the scenarios that we just discussed? Because I think that would be helpful. Because like you said, I think a lot of people don't really understand the supply chain piece. So like, for example, what, what do you want to do? Do you want to do like a, a local coffee shop? Do you want to do? I'm going to do it. I'm going to be selfish. Um, I'm going to say <laughs> we work with a lot of law firms. So All right, fine, let me walk firm. through it. Let me walk through it that way. So we work with a lot of law firms. Okay. Here are the announcement that Facebook is laying off employees, Amazon's laying off employees, Target is having, you know, they're they're experiencing, you know, additional losses. 
So mm -hmm. all of that stuff is going on. We work with law firms. The question I'm asking is, okay, all right, does this have a direct impact on my lawyers and law firms? Mm -hmm. Directly? Not, I mean, my relationship with them? No, this doesn't really have a direct impact on them. Now, mm -hmm. does this indirectly impact my law firm? So let's say, for example, if my lawyers are working with, you know, other entrepreneurs, meaning they're doing, you know, copyrights and they're doing, you know, product, um, you know, protection and IP, it may impact my client's clients. Mm -hmm. So in that respect, I'm thinking about it saying, okay, all right, this doesn't impact my relationship with the lawyers, but this may impact my lawyer's relationship with their clients. So now when I'm looking at, you know, how we're invoicing the lawyers, I'm like, OK, all right, we need to figure out like, hey, will this slow down their ability to pay us because their customers may start slowing down and paying them? So, I mean, yeah. I think that that is a practical way of looking on the customer side. Now, on the supply side, let's say, for example, you know, again, we're working with lawyers. And let's say if one of the law firm technology companies or let's say, you know, if Stripe came out and made some announcement. Mm -hmm. Now, our clients may be using Stripe. So what I need to ask myself is like, hey, if Stripe is making some changes in their headcount, how does that impact my client's ability to collect money from their customers? Because if they can't collect from their customers, then I can't collect from them. Yeah. So I think those that that would be a practical example from, like said, an audience that we work with. Yeah, I think another example that I would give staying with law firms, since we're being selfish here, is the concept of like, I, I've, I've been thinking about this actually a lot with Twitter. With everything that's going on and all of that, that drama there is, I think if you live in that area, if you are a lawyer or a law firm based in that area, this would be a really great time. And you specialize in wrongful termination suits. This would be probably a really good time for you to run some ads on Facebook, <laughs> which, is, which are cheap right now because, you know, supply and demand. It would be a great time for you to run some ads and say, hey, have you been wrongfully terminated from your job? I can bet you, you will get some pretty good, um, you will probably get some pretty good impressions on those ads. So like, I think those are, you know, great opportunities where you really need to kind of take a step back and think outside the box of like, all right, these things are happening in the grand scheme of things. It doesn't look like it impacts my business, but like as a lawyer, for example, if you, if you are in that, in that space, then it's a good time to try to get more clients in that area because you know that there's probably going to be with everything going on, um, especially at Twitter, there's probably going to be a lot of people that are filing wrongful termination suits. And this might be a good opportunity for you to get some more business. So yeah, that's, I mean, that I, would I be an example. I think, I think that also um, that element of when you look at supply and demand, like for example, with Facebook, when mm -hmm. Facebook is, you know, doing these layoffs part of it's because they've seen that hey their profits are dropping yeah. um, and a big part of that is people aren't buying ads as much so i do think from a dynamic standpoint you're gonna see the reach of organic posts and paid advertising on your facebook or instagram you may see that your post will now reach more people which means mm -hmm. As a business owner, if you're trying to get in front of more customers who can do business with you, like now would probably be a great time to right. start working on that content strategy, maybe even spending a few dollars on running some ads and stuff like that. Because when Facebook is saying like, hey, our revenue is down, we need more money, they're probably going to make their ads more attractive or make organic reach more attractive. So more people come to the platform and they can increase their revenue because a lot of major businesses are starting to cut back on their marketing budget, which personally, I think that may be a bad idea for a lot of major companies, but mm. it does create an opportunity for more small businesses because if your major companies are spending less, that means the ads and the, you know, the clicks per or the, 
the the cost per click could go down which means for your small businesses that's a great opportunity to jump in there and say hey i can get my product in front of more people at a lower cost exactly i yeah, know i agree and i think all of these are great ways that we've illustrated i mean we can do we could pick any industry and basically do the exact same thing that we did with law firms because i think when you i think oftentimes people are so f- fixated on the problem that they don't take advantage of the opportunities that come with the problems, right? Just every problem isn't meant to just be like, oh my gosh, this is horrible. Like, what are we going to do? You can definitely, as a business owner, capitalize on the issues. The other thing I was actually thinking about is there has been a labor shortage for a while. Now you have people getting laid off. You know what that means? It means that there are more people that need to work in the market, right? So a lot of it may be, of course, you know, depending on your 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 um, your industry and your business, you may need someone who's a bit more specialized, right? But, you know, if you are looking for someone who's going to do, who doesn't have as much technical savviness or, you know, who has, I guess it doesn't require as much technical savviness in your field, then you're definitely going to get an influx of options when it comes to people applying for jobs now, because unfortunately there are people getting laid off, which means that there's going to be more people applying for jobs, which means that there's going to be more options of people that you can hire. So I think you really need to find and identify the opportunities for you to maximize as a business owner, what's currently happening out there. Yeah. I mean, I think that's a really good point is that, you know, with the labor market of, you know, we've been in some people call it a labor shortage or some people mm. just call it a I call it a misalignment because I don't think that there is a shortage of people who could do the job. I think there is a shortage of people who were willing to accept yep. the job on the, the terms pay. that were that were listed, because I don't even think it's just the pay. I think some people, you know, may have been OK with the pay. It's just they just wanted to accept it on different terms. Like they wanted a different work environment or they wanted to explore a different industry or something, something that came up or maybe they just didn't like the managers or the, you know, the people within the company. But when you start seeing major companies going through layoffs and you start seeing people talking about, you know, recession, economy getting mad, like then some people start rethinking like, well, maybe those preferences weren't as important, you know, as they once were before. Yeah. And I honestly, and I think, uh, go ahead. And I, and I think that you, you will start to see some people reevaluate, you know, some of their preferences, because I do think when the economy gets tight, people, whether it's customers, whether it's employees, whether it's business owners, we do start to rethink some of our preferences like some of our preferences aren't as important as they used to be yeah no i agree with that i I think definitely people are going to start reevaluating their preferences and i don't the whole word importance i think is i guess it's i was going to say it's subjective because different things are important in different phases of your life but i think one of the things that i think is extremely important for business owners to understand is COVID really changed people's, I think I think anytime you go through any downturn or any sort of massive event um, or impact or anything that happens in the economy, the recession, uh, major layoffs, people really take time to evaluate and reevaluate and reconsider. And so you really need to think like, how are my customers working through this? How is their how have their spending behaviors changed? How are their spending? How are they? What are they? What do they consider to be important in this situation? Right. And so I think it's extremely important to kind of know what's going on with them and um, be able to pivot your business accordingly. So so yeah. So we've kind of given some examples. We've dived into that. So like when we think about like stuff your accountant isn't telling you. And we actually focus on that. Like, okay, what should accountants be telling people in these situations? Like your customer, like as a, an accountant, like what should, what, what are we, I guess maybe we can share some of the things that we've been telling our clients um, as we're kind of getting ready for, for this preparing for the downturn and putting themselves in a good position. Yeah. I mean, one of the big things that I tell clients is that, you know, downturns are great opportunities for growth. And that is where 
the people who are paying attention to what is happening, not only just at a macro level, just watching the news and, you know, pulling out their popcorn and just, you know, chit chatting with their friends, but they're paying attention for how this impacts their business and they're seeing opportunities and taking advantage of it. I think one of the things that I've told some business owners is, hey, when the economy gets tight, we've already looked at your customers and we've said, OK, all right, how much do these changes impact your customers? If your customers are very sensitive to this, then maybe we need to look at some your products and your services and say, hey, how do we come up with a lower price point version of this? Not how do we just drop your prices? No, it's like, mm. how do we take this service and we come up with a you know, with a, a, a lower cost, more affordable option of this services, which means you may take some features away, which is something that we're actively doing ourselves, like knowing that, hey, the economy is going to hit hard for a lot of business owners. We internally looked at it and said, hey, we're coming up with a new program called the Money Mastery for Small Business Owners to where it's like these small business owners may not be able to afford to pay, you know, the thousand dollars a month for having a onboard you know accountant who's looking at these things so we're going to do a money mastery program where people can pay 150 dollars a month and we'll have regular group calls as we're talking about very practical things and answering questions in a group because what it does is it allows us to still offer a level of quality. It may not be one-on-one, but I think it offers it at a price point that makes sense. So I'm telling business owners, let's look at your prices. Do we need to come up with a lower cost version that you can still generate revenue that makes sense for the client base that you're trying to reach? Yeah, that's really good because I got to be honest. I think when we first started, we were a little bit apprehensive. I don't know. I don't want to say apprehensive. I won't speak for you. I'll speak for myself. I think when we first started, there was a hesitation to do some of the lower price products or services, specifically services, because I think then you think like, well, no, like I'm offering quality. I'm offering all of these things. So like, I don't want to, I don't want, like if I'm, if I can charge someone a thousand dollars, why am I charging someone $150? But what are the, one of the things that I would say I've realized being on the, the marketing side and kind of thinking through some of the discussions is a lot of times people approach us and they're like, man, like I really, really, I feel like I get it. Like I get it. I get what you guys are saying. I get what you guys are doing. Um, but then we just find like there's that bridge, right? There's the bridge between the business owners that are just starting out or have been in business for three to five years. They have less than, you know, $400,000 in revenue a year. Um, they're still kind of trying to figure it out. They can't hire someone full time yet. Um, but then they also can't afford to bring on someone for $1,500 a month, $2,000 a month. And so then I kind of found like we weren't really, there was a gap, right? So there was the ones that were were able to, and then the ones that couldn't. And then there was all of these other business owners in the middle that were kind of getting left behind, right? And so I think I think it's, it's kind of important to, it's important to think about that as a business owner is, and I think I like what you said, Terrell, because even internally, like what we've looked at is the step up approach, right? So you can start with this, you get these features, right? Whether it's a, a monthly call with us or or you kind of the basic feature is hey you get financials they're accurate you get what you need and then you can kind of basically graduate as your business grows which is what i really like because i think offering that provides an environment where people feel like okay i don't i still get the quality in terms of like the basics um but i don't have to it's not, you know, hurting my business if I don't have that. Um, it's not hurting my business financially, basically, to do that. So you're starting, and then as your business is growing, our support is increasing. So I think that's, I think it's something important to think about. And I'm not going to lie, it took me some time in our business to be able to understand that. But I think once you do, it allows your customers to grow with you. But I think my biggest apprehension was the the aspect of like, okay, you know, are we going to be basically selling um, more for less. But really, I think the the point that you made about the adding features and taking features away definitely helps keep those boundaries there.
Yeah, I mean, I think it's it's that old. Uh, I guess how would you put it? It's kind of like that. I learned it as it's an it's a manufacturing strategy. I know when I worked in you know in aerospace technology. So in aerospace technology, you have a very base engine. Now there's a bunch of features you can add to it. Mm -hmm. Now each of those features are going to cost a little bit more. They add a little bit more usability. But if you have a very small commuter aircraft, you don't need all those features. And to be honest with you, if you're running a small commuter aircraft, you probably don't generate enough revenue to justify buying the more expensive engine. So what you really need is I need the thing that's going to work for me. And I think another example of that is like when I was living in Brazil, you know, one of the things that I learned from working with the business we were working with, you know, in the, the trucking industry where it amazed me to really start to see how industrious some of the, you know, companies were because I used to interact a lot with the team in India. And one of the things that they were saying is like the team in India, they don't want these really nice 18 wheeler trucks that you guys have in the U S what they really want is the chassis, the engine, take all that other stuff off. And they were actually taking wood and building the cabs out of wood because they're like, I only need the very base chassis. I can't afford to put, you know, a sleeper car in this and stuff like that. I can't mm -hmm. afford all these bells and whistles. And to be honest with you, I don't need all those things. And so for, for business owners, I'm constantly telling them, like, it goes back to understanding your customers and what they need. Like for us with the money mastery program, it was understanding what is it that, you know, business owners that are less than, you know, $400,000 a year in revenue, what do they need? They need access to information that answers questions that they don't have time to go figure out on their own. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, okay, all right, we won't be profitable if we start doing one-on-one -on -one conversations with all those businesses in that category, but we could be profitable if we create a program that has limited space where small business owners, less than $400,000 a year can join the program. We're going to have, you know, two calls a month where there's a topic that we're talking about. Like one topic we're talking about pricing and how to build a pricing model that is profitable for your business, where I'm going to do a screen share and what I would normally do in a one-on-one -on -one call with someone who's paying us, you know, a thousand, you know, to $2,500 a month, what I would do with that person, I'm going to do with the group and actually walk through. This is how you do it. And for the business owners that are less than $400,000 for them, it's just like, oh my gosh, this is what I needed, but I couldn't afford it one-on-one, -on -one, but I now get it in a group. They can send their questions in and we can do a video answer and answering their, you know, some of their specific questions. And I think for us, it was just that way of saying like, hey, our potential customers are going to be a little cash strapped. So how do we innovate and create a business model around still serving them? But keeping in mind what's happening in the economy, what's happening to their their income, what's happening to their budgets. And I think all of our clients, I'm telling them, hey, take a step back. You may not be able to give every client the white glove experience. Maybe you need to take a step back and look and say, hey, how can you still add value to the clients, but do it with a you know, a better price point, which means some features have to go away. But I think that's one of the biggest ones that I'm spending a lot of time with our clients to help them understand. That's good. And I think just the last point on that piece is the numbers have to make sense. Like you have to, the numbers have to make sense. So when you're thinking about like offering an alternate product or an alternate service or a one that comes without the bells and whistles, you have to think, do the numbers make sense? And by that we mean, is the business still able to make money from these services that I'm providing? So I think that's extremely important. So um, I would say, I think the 
one, the second approach or the second thing that I would be having a conversation um, about was just preparing for, I guess, if in the event of if we do lose clients, right, like how long can our business survive or how long can our business go before we're in the red? So I think it's a tough question and a lot of people may not like to ask that question, but I think for me, like understanding your, first of all, I think the biggest thing is, okay, who are your, and maybe this is two questions. So the first question I guess I would say is who are the, what services and what products are bringing in your biggest revenue? What are your re biggest revenue generators would be, I guess, the first question that I would be asking, right? Because I think if you don't understand that, um, you don't understand how much exposure your business has. Because if you are selling a product that is heavily, like, for example, if we go back to the example of the luxury company, the company that sells luxury products that's heavily dependent on Amazon, and let's say your demand really spikes up during the holidays, and Amazon just laid off 11,000 employees, well, then, you know, you might have to think, like, if my biggest product is, you know, is my biggest product, my biggest revenue generator is this product. And this product has higher demand during the holidays. And that's my biggest revenue generator. Then I need to immediately start thinking about how to generate alternate resources to basically get these products to my customers. So I think understanding that is twofold. One, it helps you prepare for, okay, what was to happen if demand was to go down in this specific area, whether the product or service that makes your biggest, that makes up your biggest revenue. Um, and then also, also helps you understand are some of the changes that are happening in the economy being impact? Are they impacting this specific product or this specific customer base? Like, for example, Terrell, like we talked about, you know, with lawyers, like, you know, if there's I'll go back to my Twitter example. Right. If you if you know that, hey, typically you you get a lot of revenue from, you know, wrongful termination lawsuits or something and you're seeing this at Twitter like okay you know this is an opportunity to help generate that but you don't really understand that unless your accountant is helping you give that helping give you that information and that visibility on what is your biggest revenue driver um for your business yeah I mean I think that's a very important one it is really you know looking at your revenue by product or service type and I think asking yourself you know that question of like you said which products and services are most susceptible or sensitive to what is going on in the economy? Because mm -hmm. once you start to look at it that way and you do, this is what I would call a sensitivity analysis, where we look at all of your products and services. We say, okay, all right, which ones are most likely to decrease as a result of what is happening in the economy or what's happening in the market? And when you start to identify that, then you can ask yourselves, well, if it's one of your lower margin products that people don't buy that much, okay, mm -hmm. not that big of a deal. But if it's your number one bestseller, then we need to come up with a strategy because you're going to see a significant drop in, in your in your revenue and your, your business performance. So I think that's a really good point. Um, one of the other things that I would say that I think, you know, you started alluding to that I think is very, a very simple one is, you know, start looking at your cash reserves. Like if you look and say, okay, all right, it costs X amount of dollars or X amount of cash that I need every month to run my operations. Let's say, you know, you're a business and it costs you, you know, $20,000 a month to cover all your base costs in your business. Well, then it's like looking at your reserves count. Like, how much money do you have set aside in your reserve count? So if you do have a bad month, hey, there's some cash for you to pull from to be able to cover while you're building things back up. Because I think a lot of people who don't have any type of reserve, those are the people who tend to get you know really hurt by downturns in the economy yeah. or they end up going out and getting you know, working capital loans that do not have a good interest rate. No, that, that's really good. I, I think that's a very important one. And 
I think the cash reserve is something that your accountant should definitely be helping you try to, should be giving you the visibility to, so you can make those decisions. Um, any other questions you're, you're thinking at this point, like, Hey, or any other topics you should be discussing, people should be discussing with their accountants where this is concerned. Um, I mean, I think we've covered some really good ones. I mean, I think, you know, I'm just going to recap because I also want to leave enough time because I, I did promise everyone we talk about FTX. What's going oh, on yeah. there? So um, just to recap, the first one is, you know, your accountant should be encouraging you to understand your customers and asking, hey, what is what's going on in the economy? How does that impact your customer base? Mm -hmm. Also, looking at your supply chain, what's going on in the economy? Will that impact your supply chain or your ability to deliver your product or your service to your clients? And then what they all should, should be asking is, are there opportunities for you to, you know what, get better returns on your marketing efforts? As we talked about specifically with Facebook. If Facebook is trying to generate more revenue, which means ads or cost per clicks may go down, that could be an opportunity. Also, is there an opportunity for you to come up with a lower price point version of the things that you already offer so that you can still continue selling at a profitable level, but you can actually make it affordable to the audience that you're targeting? I think looking at your, you know, looking at doing a sensitivity analysis, looking at all of your, your products and services that are selling, and then asking how sensitive is each product to what's going on in the market. The last one we talked about was building a cash reserve, having some cash set aside that if something does happen, things go down, your business has some cash it can tap into so you can avoid taking out what I call ugly money loans. So <laughs> I think those are some very great recaps on, you know, the things that your accountant should be having conversations with you about. No, I agree. That That's really good. So we hope we hope this episode has been helpful to you. And now we're going to jump into the big new story, FTX and what how this matters and why this is important for you as a business owner. All right. So I'm going to make it very quick. So FTX is a crypto exchange. And what most people are probably like, what the heck does that mean? So it is a place or a platform that people can go and they can exchange one cryptocurrency for another, or they can exchange it for cash and stuff like that. Um, so it's a crypto exchange. There was some they filed for bankruptcy and it is a very big news story because one of the things with FTX is the founder of FTX, his, a person he is closely related to from a romantic standpoint, was running a company called Alameda Research, which was a fund or an investment fund. So what they were doing is taking money from investors or people who put money into the fund and they would go out and they would buy other companies or they would buy other investments and stuff like that. And hopefully those investments would grow so they can return a profit to those people. Well, one of the things that came out is that Alameda was like owned almost like 50% of the FTX exchange. So you have almost like this related party kind of transaction to where the money coming in Alameda was heavily invested in FTX and FTX tokens. So it's like FTX value as a company was being propped up by this other company that they partially owned. Now, where you start to come into an issue is that some of the some of the 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 I guess you say the investments that Alameda made and FTX made started going down. So now you have these two things that are kind of intertwined and invested in one another and their values both started dropping. Well, there was another competitor out called Binance, which Binance noticed this. Now, it is some speculation because Binance is also a competitor of FTX. Some people are saying that Binance did it intentionally to get rid of one of the competitors um, because 
the founder of FTX was very closely related to US politicians and working on crafting political policy that could have potentially negatively impacted other for other crypto exchanges. And so Binance announced like, hey, we are concerned about FTX. We're selling our $2 billion share. Well, when they made that announcement, the, the price and the value of FTX and their token just started dropping like a rock. So when you have Alameda, FTX, they're kind of intertwined, both invested in one another. Well, when the value of one starts dropping, it starts causing a horrific drop in the value of the other. So, of course, investors were like, hey, I want to get out of this. And they started. So, like, within three days, there was like six billion dollars worth of people trying to sell off. And so this has caused a lot of concern and a lot of investigations of was what FTX was doing illegal were they, you know, pretty much stealing money from one business to prop up another business? Were they taking money to funnel it to politicians? All of this stuff going on. I now, have one question. What's up? Who is their accountant? I That's don't know who their accountant know. was. Um, Do they have an accountant? Because that information hasn't shady. come out. This that information. Well, let me say. I have not seen that information. Now, if they are a publicly traded company, I would say they, they should have had some type of an accounting firm. That yeah. information I don't think has been made public. And, and I do think, you know, the main point that I would say to business owners is I think for one is you have to get the fundamentals of a business right. The fundamentals of a business is you provide a service or a product for a profit. And Whatever is going on with the money that comes on into your business, you have to have good, I guess you say, separation of that money. Like you can't be taking money you got from one business and just, I guess you say, mismanaging it and then just handing it over to other businesses that you own or other related businesses. You, If you have a business, let's say you have business A, you have business B. You want to treat those as two separate businesses and you want to ask yourself questions like, hey, why would business A loan money to business B? Is this a business decision or is this some kind of underhanded you know, situation going on? Which is what was happening when you look at FTX and Alameda. When you looked at all the money that Alameda was funneling into FTX, if you if those were two separate companies owned by two unrelated parties and you looked at that, you would probably say this doesn't look like a actual legit business deal that any rational person would make. So you want to look at your business and make sure that, hey, based on the decisions that you are making in your business, ask yourself, would a rational person who is not related to me make this same decision with this money? And if the answer is no, you probably should consider maybe we need to put a few more checks and balances in here so we don't make bad money decisions that could end up tanking the company. And then I think the other thing is you can't get away from the fundamentals of business. So like with Alameda, FTX, they were buying up other companies and they were investing in all these other companies. And they lost sight of the fundamentals because they were investing in companies that were losing money or they were investing in companies that were on the verge of going bankruptcy themselves. So if you're constantly buying bankrupt businesses or you're constantly buying things that don't make sense, eventually that's going to impact you. And I would say that for all of our small businesses, especially those that sell products, when you look at your inventory, do not continue buying inventory items that are not selling. Now, that sounds obvious, but it is something that I have seen happen time and time again. When you look at a business and you look at their inventory and we start to look at, okay, all right, which products are selling versus which products are not selling? And you look and they have a ton of stuff that's not selling. You ask the question like, 
Why do you keep buying this? No one else. Your customers don't want this. Your customers are not asking for this product. All you're doing is throwing money down the drain because you're buying stuff that people don't want. So I think you have to actually look at that and say, hey, are we putting our money where it matters? Now, if you're a service-based business, where I see this happen a lot is where there are service-based businesses that are putting money into marketing. And I'm like, you're marketing the product or the service that no one is buying. Why do you keep putting marketing dollars advertising that service? Nobody's buying it. Stop doing that because you're just throwing money into something that doesn't make sense. So there is a lot that will probably unfold. And, I, and I've even heard and, and I think it's true that there will probably be movies made about, oh, you yeah. know, the FTX, you know, almost <clears throat> similar to like the movie The Big Short. Mm. There's going to be a lot of the movies that come out or. I, I even heard that there are even talks in Hollywood of someone already trying to buy the rights to the movie. Uh, they're, they're already trying to write it already. Oh, <laughs> um, gosh. I, I don't know why. Every time, like, I keep thinking about Firefest. Like, I, I just, the Firefest documentary, was it called Fire Festival? Firefest yeah. on Yulu? I just keep thinking about that documentary because, and I don't know, like, I'm not going to lie. Like, cryptocurrency is something that I haven't really spent I, as much time on, but it, like, I think just this whole FTX situation for me is it gives me like the approach, at least if I remember, like when you and I were talking about like some of the things that he did and some of the things that like he was he was um, the approaches that he took, like with the two companies with um, uh, Almeida Research, it's just like this is really dangerous because you're moving money around. There's no regulation on how this money is being moved or little regulation. Um, and so it, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of things that can be done and it's a, it's becoming a bigger part of the economy. So, but yeah. yeah. I mean, and it's not, it wasn't a small thing. I mean, you're talking like, you know, at one point FTX, you know, they were investing, like they had backing from, you know, you know, they were had Super Bowl Tom commercials. Yeah. There were celebrities like Giselle, Tom Brady, Steph Curry, um, you know, what Ortiz and in the MB, like the Major League Baseball, the Formula One racing. They actually own, I think they bought the Miami Heat Stadium. And that then stadium is also, now on sale. <laughs> and now when you look at it, well, I think because of the bankruptcy, it may be they they I think the bankruptcy and the investigation froze their assets. Mm -hmm. Because you have, you know, a company that was, I think the valuation might have been somewhere around like 32 billion at one point. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you're thinking about a lot of money and there's a lot of people who put their money into this where they're not going to see it. Well, hopefully they'll be able to get some of their money back. I, I even saw some where I think there was a um, there was a pension plan, like a public pension plan from like a, a city or a state that had invested in this. Now, these are people's retirement money that mm -hmm. you invested in it that has just now just gone to, they're going to have to like scrap and fight in That's court sad. to try yeah. to get something back. And I think at the end of the day, it comes down to like, whatever you're going to put your money in, whether it's in, your, in an area in your business or you're going to invest in something on the open market, you have to ask yourself, you know, what are the fundamentals of this? How is this thing going to actually make money? And if it doesn't make sense to you, it might not be the thing for you. You might need to take a step back and say, hey, if I don't understand how this thing is going to make money, then I might not be ready to invest in this thing. And so I always tell people, make sure you do your homework. And if you don't understand how that thing is going to help you grow or help you make money, you probably want to take a second look at whether or not you need to put your money into it. So thank you guys so much for tuning in for another great episode. Until next time.